considering the showpiece game in the Premier League over Easter was an incredibly drab nil-nil, mm. the Championship's showpiece game of the weekend really put that to shame. Two attacking teams going at it. It's what you want on a, on a bank holiday Monday. Standard of limbs at Portman Road, <laughs> just unreal. It was just dramatic absolute highs. Unreal. What an advert for the championship. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Second Tier Podcast. I'm Ryan Dilks and I'm joined by the Ian Foster to my Stephen Schumacher. It's Justin Peach. Good day to you, Ryan. Oh, Justin. Oh, Justin, Justin, Justin. It is a pleasure to be speaking to you today. I uh, hope you had a wonderful Easter weekend. I have got a question for you to kick things off. Wow. Would you class yourself as a man perhaps even you'd class yourself as a real man's man uh is that a question or a statement because it feels like it's loaded a little bit just would you class yourself as a man yes not a, I, I, not I, a man I, a man all right I, no i would okay okay <laughs> fine well, the only reason I ask is, um, assuming that you did think yourself as a as a bit of a man, um, would you agree with me that one of the most enjoyable things you can do as a man is going to the tip? Because I went <laughs> yeah. yesterday and I thought to myself, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to spending the whole day sat on the sofa watching championship football. But you know what would make this day even better? A quick tip to the tip, to a quick trip to the tip, I should say. A quick um, tip to the tip. You know, to to just you know launch a printer into a skip. Do, yeah. do, you, do you get what I'm saying, Justin? No, absolutely. The absolute satisfa satisfaction when something breaks apart as soon as mm. it makes contact with something else in one of those giant bin boxes at the tip is the most satisfying thing, I think. Oh, Justin, <clears throat> Justin, 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 let me, let me stop you right there. I had a drawer which I lobbed into a skip mm -hmm. And it got impaled on an upright plank of wood. <laughs> Honestly, it was one of the greatest thrills I'll have all year. Yeah, and uh, the annoying and sad thing is, you can't, you can't, you can only have a, a certain amount of tip runs a year because there's only a certain things you could afford to literally throw and it destroy itself as soon as mm. it makes contact with something else. There's just not enough of that in a house unless you're clearing out a house, um, which you know doesn't happen very often. It's because it that's my first point. You do, you just don't get enough tip runs. Yeah. What's the, what's the greatest thrill you get from throwing us an item into a tip? I think it's just seeing it literally just fold itself. Like mm. I, I when I when I removed my kitchen a couple of years ago, I threw I threw a, a cupboard in and it just split into all four pieces. Oh, that's like, satisfying. Well, it's, it's gone back to its original, apart from it being a tree, it's gone back to its original form. <laughs> Very good point. Be very impressive if it did turn into a tree when you throw it into a skip. Welcome to the No More Championship Podcast, the second tier. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. Yeah, I mean, what a weekend. What a weekend of Easter action we have just had. And Easter Monday was probably somehow topping Good Friday, you might say, because some of the action we got was marvellous. So we'll talk about all of the action from Easter Monday. Of course, three, all three of the top three won, which uh, keeps things interesting right at the top. We've also got the promotion race where all the teams chasing sixth lost. Um, so that was kept interesting as well. And then the relegation battle as well. And what's happened at Plymouth Argyle with Ian Foster finally being relieved of his duties there. So we'll talk about that in part two of the show uh, but plenty for us to get our teeth into from Easter Monday here in the championship and we'll kick things off with probably the game of the Easter weekend Ipswich Town remain top of the league it's after a dramatic 3-2 win against Southampton they were 2-1 down but then they got one back they kept pushing and pushing for a for a third looked like it perhaps wouldn't come in time and then the 97th minute, Jeremy Sarmiento toe pokes it past Gavin Bazzuno in the Southampton goal. What a game, Justin. Honestly, unreal. Honestly, it was fantastic. I, I don't want Ipswich to get promoted. I'm going to throw that right there. Wow. Okay. I don't want Ipswich just to get promoted. Just that in straight away. <laughs> yeah, just, just diving straight in two feet. I'm not messing about. The reason why I'm saying it now is, is purely, purely for the value they give the neutral. Week by week. Game by game. It's incredible. It's so unique to have a team who do this so often. It's not healthy, but it's so unique. 
So the, the whole reason why I don't want Ipswich to get promoted is because I want to keep seeing this. I don't want it to go away. It's just absolutely unreal. And I don't think you've got... I don't think we've had a team as relentless as Ipswich are um, in terms of pushing for results because they just keep you on the edge of the seat for the entire 90 minutes plus. 90 minutes plus. Um, I mean, Southampton did their very best as well in this game, but... Um, you know, two attacking teams going at it. It's what you want on a on a bank holiday Monday. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was gripped throughout this game. Put put it this way: considering the showpiece game in the Premier League over Easter was an incredibly drab nil nil, mm. the Championship's showpiece game of the weekend really put that to shame. It was just thrilling. The back and forth of momentum throughout the game. Loads of little subplots of players having these individual battles. It's got to be said, I'm not sure how Sam Morsey avoided a second yellow because he seemed to do his utmost best to try and get sent off in this one. And then the straight red for James Bree as well. I'm not totally sure it was a red, but that's by the by. The thing is, Southampton were much the better team for the majority of the game. And then Ipswich just turned the screw and the limbs, oh, just in the limbs when Sarmiento <laughs> scored, were simply marvellous, weren't they? Yeah, they were. They were. I mean, we've seen it so many times now already. The, 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 the standard of limbs at Portman Road are just unreal. But that they, they were special. I also heard some of the local commentary from, uh, from the BBC radio um, stations. And it was just pure passion, just oozing out. And you can imagine what the fans were feeling when Sarmiento's really unorthodox finish because the how did he get up so feet. quickly, Justin? Yeah. How did he get up so quickly? He was on the floor and it looked like the chance had gone. Exactly, exactly. It's just the, the ball was literally under him. And he you know, he gets up and he pokes it. And he, the, the, the ball moves in so slowly. It was just drama at its absolute highest. Unreal. Yeah, he managed to defy gravity in that very moment and get back on his feet. It was remarkable. But what a moment and big bag of cliches time. What an advert for the championship because <laughs> it was such a good game. And it's another win for Ipswich Town, who remain top of the championship with six games remaining. The Ipswich are going up tractor. It's now like the DeLorean at the end of Back to the Future 1, where it's just flying uh, and, it, you know, it doesn't need wheels anymore at this stage, Justin. In all seriousness, though, when Ipswich are winning games like that, in that manner, does even someone like you, an Ipswich sceptic, start to think that Ipswich are almost destined for promotion? I, I think destiny is almost um, discrediting the work that Kieran McKenna does. But you are right. If, you, if you're going to believe the aura surrounding these these moments that they keep plugging away for themselves yeah it's hard to disagree with the notion that destiny is pushing them towards towards promotion you score this many late winners so late in games you show a certain amount of stubbornness you show resilience you show the middle finger to those who say you can't keep doing it like um, you it's, yeah like like somebody <laughs> else on this podcast um, and it's just, yeah, it, it's got to be, it's got to be destiny. And I think, in addition, and it's really important. I think it shows the importance of the depth they've got in their team in terms of the quality. Sarmiento said he was disappointed not to start the game, but he knew he would get a chance coming off the bench, and uh, and boy, did he! That you know, that's a team. That is a team right there, and that is that is the thing that's putting him through. Not destiny. None of this hoodoo. Okay, it is depth. It is teamwork. It is grit. That is what's doing it for Ipswich. Yeah, well, sometimes a club's destiny just seems to be written in the stars. And when you have got things like Jeremy Sarmiento toe-pegging it in in the 97th minute against Southampton and Vaclav Hradki pulling off that ridiculous save after being caught in possession against Blackburn, Ipswich will definitely feel like destiny is on their side. Uh, just kind of going off the back of what you were saying, Justin, please don't for a second think that I'm saying their potential promotion is down to luck. And I know... Leeds and Leicester fans have frequently been labeling, labeling Ipswich as lucky uh, on social Smart media look. over the past few weeks. But you don't win as many games as them and lose as few as them by being lucky. You do it by being well drilled, working extremely hard on the training ground, recruiting really well and having a top manager. And that's what Ipswich have done. This isn't luck. They have earned this. And they deserve to be top of the league because aside from a dip around the new year, they've been absolutely sublime. And as far as promotion is concerned, it's looking like it may very well actually be happening. It's becoming more... It's, at this stage, you'd probably say it's more likely than not likely. I mean, the next game is the East Anglian derby 
on Saturday, which is, of course, a tricky game, particularly with Norwich's form in 2024. Then after that, they've got Watford, who look rejuvenated under Tom Cleverley. Middlesbrough after that can be great, can be poor. So who knows? Hall and Coventry after that, both chasing the top six. And then Huddersfield on the final day, who have been shocking recently, but are fighting to stay up. Still a lot of work to do, Justin, but mostly games Ipswich Town should be winning. I think it's a nice run of fixtures because I think if you take in the context of playing Middlesbrough um, and Hull at the time that they'll be playing them, they'll be out of the playoff race you'd expect. I mean, Hull are looking unlikely now. So I think it's a really nice run of fixtures uh, for Ipswich. And as you say, I think another thing you need to point out is they're, they, they're, Ipswich are a super fit team. To be able to go for as long as they have for as consistently as they have, I think, yeah, you've got to be a super, super fit team as well. So that's that's more credit there for, for Ipswich. But that run of games that they've got, I think is um, yeah. I think it's actually quite healthy. I know. I know the Norwich one's a bit ooh, okay, but then again, they lost quite convincingly against Norwich uh, against Leicester. Sorry, so maybe that's a you know for coming off the gas for David Wagner's side. And, you know, Ipswich. Will, as soon as Ipswich smell blood, they go, don't they? They are a foxhound, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, not sure about foxhound, but you are right. Um, they compare Ipswich's fixtures to Leeds and Leicester. Both of them have still got to play Southampton and then Leicester, uh, Leicester have still got to play West Brom as well. So maybe you will be looking at and saying Ipswich have probably got the more favourable fixtures. If they come out of the Norwich game s- smelling of roses still, mm-hmm. then it's hard to deny that they will get promoted at that stage. It's got to be said. So it's looking very, very good from an Ipswich Town perspective. And um, Let's touch on Southampton because in fairness to them, they did play really well for large parts of this and it did feel a bit harsh for them not to get something. Heading into the game, they still had an outside chance of automatic promotion, but that's over now, isn't it, Justin? It's going to be the playoffs for Ross Martin's side, isn't it? It's 11, but they're 11 points off uh, Leicester at the moment, and, and Leicester are the team that are looking a little bit... I know they've got two games in hand on both Ipswich and Leeds, but it's just difficult to see them see them pushing into... Um, Push it, yeah, pushing into the top two. I say it's 11 points off Leicester, Leicester a third, 12 points off Leeds, so it's a slightly even bigger gap. Um, and Games I think as well, though, haven't they? But still, yeah, but you know, they halve it to six points, and you get to that stage of the season where it's okay, are, are these teams going to drop that many points? They're going to yeah. lose two on the bounce to allow Southampton back in. If they do, then you know, Southampton needs to take needs to take the, the onus and go for it, but I don't think they're quite there yet. I don't know why they just seem like a team that just a millimetres off where they need to be at the moment and that's uh, it's frustrating but it's you know, probably to be expected because it's a complex style of play under Russell Martin it's his first season in charge of, of the Saints and it's a you know, relatively young team in places as well Yeah well it's a bit mad really that a side who went 22 games unbeaten are out of contention from automatic promotion with six or seven games <laughs> remaining <laughs> because unfortunately their early form and then their form in February has cost them I mean I say it like that, it's not a lot, but the sheer standard of the top four this season means that's all it takes. In a normal season, Southampton probably wouldn't be far off the top two, but this is a pretty extraordinary season. So they're set for the playoffs, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I'd say it's better than missing out on the final day because it means you can prepare appropriately and mentally yeah. for what's ahead, can't you? And as it stands, they'll probably end up facing West Brom, which is a, a juicy one, a contrast in styles. And I'm sure we'll focus more on that when we have to cross that bridge, Justin. But I suppose, you know, one final thing I'll say is, I told you Southampton were destined to finish fourth. I was saying it for weeks and uh, you told me around December time that I was daft for suggesting that. Never doubted it for a sec, Justin. <laughs> I don't know why you're coming at me here, but yeah, you say you're saying it in the midst of an unbeaten run. It's very hard to say that you know, a team's destined to finish fourth despite being unbeaten for a large portion of the season or the largest portion of the season at that point. So, you know, get in, get on your high horse and get rid, man. No one, no one needs it. No one needs that today. Yeah, yeah. Well, it it, just, it always just seemed to me like Southampton weren't as good as Ipswich, Leeds, and Leicester. Um, and while at one point it did look like Southampton may be well in the midst of the automatic promotion race, you know, time has come to pass that they just weren't as good as Leeds, Leicester and Southampton, uh, Ipswich, sorry. Um, so that's that's how it's played out in the end. Southampton look like they could be losing their technical director, Jason Wilcox. He's been approached by Manchester United. Manchester United. Southampton are said to be angry over the approach. 
all seems to be getting a bit messy with claims that Southampton may put him on gardening leave so that United have to pay compensation and what have you. So we'll leave that there until something actually happens, I suppose. But yeah, it's a bit of a strange one, it's got to be said. Let's go on to Leeds. They scored twice late on to beat Hull 3-1. It sees them stay second. Quite a lot to take in from this game. We'll start with Leeds' performance because for the second game in a row, it wasn't a brilliant one, was it? But they got the job done, Justin, eventually. I don't know what you expect at this stage of the season. I I don't mind that. I don't mind that. Injuries take hold, fatigue sets in. It's a lot to ask a team to be 100% all the time. I I was reading some of the post-game stuff. Glenn Kamara was playing through illness. Joe Rodon was having back spasms. Sam Byram said at half-time he couldn't run anymore. Uh, Daniel Fark is going to be buzzing with that. I think I'm buzzing with that because you win when so many things are up against you like that. I think it means a little bit more. And you win when you're not playing particularly well either. Again, it just means a little bit more and it means you're going in the right direction. And I'll keep saying it, I'll keep banging that drum. I think I said it in the previous episode. Good teams win poorly. And Leeds weren't at their vintage best, but they won. They got the job done. They're getting it done. And that's exactly what good championship winning teams do. When you have a bad day, they make sure they get take something home. We can't say that about Le- uh, Leicester, sorry. We can't say that about Southampton, sometimes even Ipswich, although the outlier at the moment is saying they, they are doing that. So, yeah. They will, they will hit the stride again. They just need they just need a I would know a couple of days off, a couple of days in a hot bath. They'll be all right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the hot bath will do the mold. Justin, I I think you are right because um, early in the season the problem with Leeds was they were not playing well, and then it would cost them. They'd have this one game in five, wouldn't they, where they just didn't play very well. But now mm. they are getting results and. I mean, Leeds have done that twice now over Easter where they were subpar against Watford and subpar against Hull and they managed to get four points out of it, which isn't to be sniffed at, really. I still think it is a bit of a worry that we have seen a dip because you've got to remember before the international break, they were absolutely fantastic. And this is why I would like to take this moment to call out someone, and that's producer Finn, or as I like to call him, Finn the Coward, because you can't hear or see him right now, but just know that he's hearing every word of this. I said in the last episode that the alarm bells would be ringing if Leeds didn't play well here and didn't get a result, which I thought was a valid thing to say. If if Leeds didn't get a result against Hull, if they if they even lost, then the alarm bells were, would be ringing, or if they even drew, I think the alarm bells would be ringing. But Finn the coward, decided to cut it from the podcast. Luckily, it still made it into the YouTube video. However, I just wanted people to know that I'm being silenced by the mainstream media here. Anyway, I'll get off my high horse now. The point I'm making is that Leeds will be breathing a huge sigh of relief that Regan Slater decided to commit that daft challenge late on on Crescencio Somerville. Otherwise, I genuinely think the alarm bells would have been massively ringing here, Justin. I, I disagree. I, I don't. I don't think. Well, if that's Leeds, the, if the Leeds case. played poorly for two games in a row and drew two games in a row, but they haven't. You don't think they are? Well, they nearly did, but they, they they haven't. I think that's the thing. They haven't. Well, I know they haven't, but they were fortunate, weren't they? I wouldn't say they were. They were, they were fortunate. You Justin, are right. Hang on a second. Yeah, hang, no, 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 hang, no, no, hang on. No, no, no. Hang on. Let me finish. So against Watford, they got an, a late equaliser after Jamal Lewis kicked it on to Mattia Joseph. And then against Hull, they got a last-minute penalty to win the game after Regan Slater committed a really daft challenge late on. You know, that is a bit of fortune on their behalf, isn't it? Or is it destiny? It might yeah. be destiny, but it is also fortunate at the same time, isn't it? But, but it might be destiny. If it's, if it's destiny of Ipswich, it's destiny of Leeds as well. I, feel, I think it feels more <laughs> destiny with Ipswich than it does Leeds. But do you not think... If we were sat here right now where it was a draw, that no, the alarm bells would be ringing? But, but it wouldn't. OK, yeah, if they, if, they didn't, if they didn't pick up the three points, yes. It'd be a very stressful time for, for Leeds because they, they dropped two points. They're now a few, a few more points off of Ipswich. But it hasn't happened, so it's not really too much to, to write home about. I think the biggest alarm bell is the fact that they are getting a couple of injuries. Um, you know, I think that's the biggest alarm bell for Leeds is if they start to lose players. Uh, at this stage of the season, they can't. They need to. They need to inject them with whatever they inject them with before games to get them through them, get them in a hot bath after the game, and uh, let's see, yeah, get through it essentially because there's only a few weeks left this season. What did you make of Crescencio Somerville taking the penalty off Joel Pirro, Justin? I, I can say one thing: he's got some bloody bollocks on him, hasn't he? <laughs> he has, but I, I didn't really make much of it. I thought I thought he was absolutely right to take it. Somerville was in form. He's taken penalties. He scored twice this season. 
Pirro's not scored in ten games. I think he. I think I'd have taken the ball off of Joel Pirro at that point. It's like Joel, really? you've, Joel, you've not you've not scored in ten games, mate. I've scored a couple. I, I'm 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 a happy man. Let me take it. It's a big penalty. Needs a big player in form. And that's me. Just I'm, not, I'm not sure I would have had the same confidence as you, Justin, because when I, when I was watching this unfold, I suddenly started watching through my fingers because I thought to myself, I've seen this film before. I mean, how many times have we seen it happen over the years where two players have argued over who's taking a penalty for it to then be followed up by the most poorly struck penalty you've ever seen? It, but it was but it was a beautiful penalty because he stroked it down the middle. The balls on some of them to do that, but also the knowledge because. Always go down the middle late in the game. Always go down the middle of the penalty late in the game. Somerville did that. I don't think Joel Pirro would have done that. Yeah, he managed to withstand the pressure, which is impressive because doing something like that, taking the ball off someone else for a penalty, just powers the pressure on the taker. And for it to happen that late in such a pivotal game as well, I mean, oh, dear me, I would have loved to have known what Daniel Farker was thinking at the time. But yeah, you're right. Fair play to Somerville. I, I enjoyed how he didn't even say to Piro, I'm taking this. He just walked up and picked up the ball. <laughs> that made me laugh. Um, yeah, could just not find fewer fucks given. Just great stuff from him. Um, should also give a mention to Dan James, scoring from the halfway line. 96th minute, Ryan Alsop gone up for a whole corner. I know it was an open goal, Justin, but he still had so much to do. And I think it was a really well-taken goal. I think it was. They are well-hit shots when you've got to do it because you're moving at pace and Dan James really moves at pace. Um, obviously, it's not as spectacular because he's not chipped the goalkeeper, but the angle, he's, on the, he's at the byline. It's, yeah, it's incredibly hard to pull off. As I say, you're running at pace, the ball's bouncing, you have a long way out. You're under pressure from a, a couple of Hall players as well. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. There's a really good fan angle of it, actually, that leads that posted on Twitter. Um, that is worth uh, is worth a, a, yeah, a quick view because it's a, a beautiful sort of yeah display of the angle of the, the the goal. It was yeah really really well well recorded. Good angle from the fan there. Yeah, but it happens so often where a player has an open goal and shoots from that far out, and they just make a complete mess of it. But you know, considering the angle and how far out he is, I actually think he's done really well because a right footer from that angle, he's got to judge the curl and. You know, fair play to him for being able to hold his nerve because he could have very easily dragged it wide and it's probably a lot harder than people will give it credit for. I think it's particularly special when you remember he missed the penalty which meant Wales missed out on a place at the Euros last <laughs> week. So a small bit of redemption for him with that in mind. But yeah, I think it was a much diff much more difficult goal than people may think uh, first first viewing of it. Uh, so Leeds stay second, one point behind Ipswich, a point ahead of Leicester, who do have a game in hand. A quick word on Hall, Justin, who are now winless in six. Did play really well against Leeds, probably deserved something from the game and perhaps would have got it if it wasn't for that Regan Slater daft challenge. Their playoff chances weren't too affected by the loss, though, by virtue of the fact that all four teams chasing sixth place lost. Looking at their remaining games, they've got a decent set of fixtures, haven't they? Um, they've now played their most difficult game from, their, from the remaining fixtures from the international perspective point of view. They've got Cardiff, Middlesbrough, QPR, Watford, Coventry, Ipswich. That's obviously a difficult game, maybe, as well. Um, is at home, though. Uh, and then Plymouth. So, decent set of fixtures to go in there. Yeah, there is, but they've 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 dropped points against teams that they should be beating, like Birmingham. Uh, they've lost to Stoke, obviously as well. Uh, and uh, Preston was a, I wouldn't say a winnable game, but a game they needed to to come away with three points in. There's uh, just a lot there about, about Hull that's not convincing me at the moment. I think they're they're a good possession side, but there's not enough. There's not enough punch. There's not enough. You know, what's the word I'm looking for? There's not enough metal there to to, to really turn these games around. Um, and you know, although although they were. Deserving of at least maybe something from Ellen Road. I, I thought Leeds were probably more deserving of the three points, to be honest with you, because I don't think Hull offered a hell of a lot um, with it within the game, to be honest. So, yeah, there's there's just something missing, which shouldn't be the case, because they had such a good January. They've got so much attacking talent. It just feels like a missed opportunity this season for Hull, and I can't see myself being convinced over them, um, convinced by them over the likes of Norwich and, and Coventry at the moment. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I mean, when you ask the question a couple of months ago or even just a month ago 
who would be the team getting to sixth place. I imagine a lot of neutrals would have said Hull based off the January business they did, which was very impressive. But you are right, they've dropped some daft points recently. You can now add leads to that collection as well. Um, and it just seems like they are missing something, which is unfortunate. Maybe it is a striker. I know a lot of Hull fans have been uh, conversing recently about who should be starting up front for them. But yeah, it's... Uh, they, they haven't maybe taken the step forward in recent weeks that uh, people may have been expecting, which is a shame. But they're, they're still in the race for the top six. It just seems like they're uh, not... They haven't got as much momentum as the likes of Coventry and Norwich, have they? Uh, Leicester got only their second win in seven league games by beating Norwich 3-1. Whew, and breathe. It got to be said, Leicester looked so nervy in that first 20 minutes. But when Norwich scored, I, I thought, oh no... It's happening again. And then from that point onwards, Leicester were a much better team. It was almost like the goal made them go, right, let's stop dicking around now. We need to actually put a foot down and get promoted. And from that point on, they controlled the game. It was attack after attack. And eventually the result came. And boy, did they need it, Justin. You could see the relief when that Vardy shot went in, actually. I mean, even even Moreski displaying so much as much joy as he did um, with the goals. I haven't seen maybe that all season. And it's it's so so important as you say they they really did need that. I was speaking to a few Leicester fans before the game actually, and they were they were nervous not only about the game but the outcome of the season. Obviously, with the weight of everything going on behind the scenes, it's such a contrast. So, so that win against a really good side with a lot of attacking quality as well, that weight really does get lifted because I say you beat you beat good teams. It gives you it gives you confidence. And, and Norwich are one of the better attacking teams, and they possess some of the better attacking players in the division. And Leicester largely nullified them. And I think that's a big thing as well. They, they they controlled the game. They actually controlled the game. And um, they allowed their quality to speak for itself. Still maybe a lot to do to, to, to generate some momentum. But this is a start. A needed, a much needed start. Yeah, much needed. You could hear the sigh of relief in Norwich, Justin. Uh, Leicester were brilliant. It was like watching the Leicester we've seen more often than not this season. Kean and Dewsbury Hall ran the game. It was his best performance in quite a while. And... Ditto, Steffi Mavididi, Ricardo Pereira started for the first game after first time after getting injured, and I think this showed how much of a miss he's been during this slump in form for Leicester. It was just a great showing, and Leicester looked back to their best. Whether that's a corner turned, only time will tell, but we needed this, didn't we, Justin, <laughs> to keep the automatic promotion race interesting, because yeah. otherwise I was a bit fearful it may just be Ipswich and Leeds. So thankfully, Leicester... Seem to have got back on track somewhat. Uh, only time will tell, though, as I say, whether they are, you know, the real deal when it comes to automatic promotion. Uh, Norwich were a bit flat here, weren't they? One of the poorest performances we've seen from them in a long time. I, I suppose you have got to keep in mind they were playing Leicester, who have been out of form, but are still very strong. As far as, Ips, uh, as, far as Norwich's top six hopes are concerned, they weren't affected at all. As mentioned, all the teams chasing sixth place lost. So really, I suppose it was a bit of a... Decent Easter Monday from an Norwich perspective. It does add a bit of extra spice to next Saturday's East Anglian derby, though. Not only would a win strengthen their playoff bid, but they'd also greatly harm Ipswich's promotion chances. And the thing is, I'm genuinely not sure what, what Norwich fans would prefer. Playoffs yeah. or Ipswich not getting promotion? It's quite a tough one to call without being a Norwich fan, Justin. I think, yeah, maybe maybe they would prefer the playoffs. Because Ipswich will still get, you know, they'll still I'm have a chance sure, of Justin. getting promoted. I'm not yeah, sure. Was, yeah, but Ipswich will still have a chance of getting promoted if they, even if they drop out of the top two. So I, I think Norwich fans will want to get into the playoffs and, and hope, hope to God that Norwich drop out of the top two race and then Ipswich uh, and then Norwich do them in the playoffs. That'll be, that'll be a thing. But if Norwich get three points against them, that will strengthen their playoff position and damage Ipswich's championship title push which will be which will be a, you know, a really really nice feeling I imagine for, for Ken Aries fans yeah could only be the second or four East Anglian derbies if uh, Norwich's ideal season pans out really couldn't it because um, you're right there's a, there's a decent chance we will have Ipswich v Norwich in the playoffs still um, but with regards to which would they prefer I, I think some Norwich fans genuinely would prefer Ipswich miss out on promotion yeah. as opposed to uh, their own chances. I'll make my point here. I want Norwich to win. Okay. Oh, for God's sake. Okay. Yeah. Right. This isn't Ipswich skepticism, but I want Norwich to win because I want it. I don't want Ipswich to get promoted because I want more of this drama they provide for, from a viewing perspective. Um, and, and as well as that, it means that we potentially get 
an old farm derby in the playoffs as well. I, this is what everybody wants. Mm. Everybody wants this. It's, it's no I'm not, disrespect. I'm not sure that's what I want. I, I I would like to see Ipswich get it over the line after the season they've had. But you're a fool. I, you're a fool. Purely for the content, it's which are fantastic. Mm, maybe. Um, but I, I, th- I think just because, obviously, the playoffs is such a lottery, um, some Norwich fans will be looking at that and going, I'd rather just Ipswich not getting promoted because they just know. People don't really realise how you know intertwined Norfolk and Suffolk are with the derby. So norwich fans would not be hearing the end of it if ipswich were to get promoted so if they uh, had the choice i think a lot of norwich fans would be choosing ipswich not get promoted as opposed to them getting the playoffs which is self-sabotage but i genuinely think that's what a lot of people would choose Uh, justin let's take a quick break after that we'll talk about plymouth sacking ian foster and some of the other games in the relegation battle Welcome back to the second tier podcast. So we'll talk about some of the games in the relegation battle, JP, and we'll kick things off with Plymouth. And they've sacked head coach Ian Foster. It's after suffering eight defeats in 11 games, the latest being at home to Bristol City. In a statement, the club said Ian's coaching credentials really stood out when we made the appointment. We have given him as long as possible to see if results could improve. Unfortunately, this hasn't been the case. We feel now is the right time to make a change to give us the best chance of securing survival director of football Neil Doosnip will take charge for the rest of the season and um, Justin Foster sacking it's not a surprise this has happened the surprise is that it didn't happen sooner yeah it should have happened sooner when we discussed his future in the inter- international break I think we were we were both right in saying that uh, club made a mistake now's the time to do it but they seem a bit of a nice club they give him a two game stay of execution and boom he's, he's gone it's it's quite it's quite impressive really, but but yeah, yeah Plymouth, to, to to not beat around the bush, Plymouth have become a terrible team, a really really terrible team, which is staggering because they're not, they're a good side, they showed that for almost two thirds of the season, and then Foster came in and and it, and it went tits, it went completely tits, and it's just it's just staggering really the the drop off, and for me it would have been really really difficult to make this team not very good at attacking, but Foster achieved that. And it's quite staggering. Um, it was a poor appointment. They needed a leader. They needed a, a big character with a clear footballing philosophy. And, and Foster offered none of that. I'm just looking at the stats from the game now. The two shots on target at home. It's just, it's just not good enough. It's a complete contrast and a drop off from this side. That was young and exciting and unpredictable. And now they're predictable, boring and just bland. Yeah, well, they were also a pretty comfortable mid-table side when Ian Foster came in and didn't look like they had any chance of getting relegated. But unfortunately, it's gone pretty much as badly as it possibly could. Um, And that's why they are now one of the teams staring firmly down the barrel of relegation. I mean, when you've got your own fans chanting for the manager to be sacked, that should be a hint that now's the time to sack the manager they should have done it during the international break and I'm not really sure why they didn't because they've cost themselves two games where they could have very easily got some precious precious points in terms of staying up and they've really shot themselves in the foot with that one I mean Plymouth are a very well well run club and this whole saga doesn't really change my mind on that I still think they are a very well run club but they haven't handled this situation very well and you talk about you know, what Ian Foster's done to this Plymouth team, Justin. They were the top scorers at home this season in the whole entire league. They've now failed to score in five home games, which is the first time that's happened in club history, as far as uh, as I'm told. Um, and that goes, I think that's a pretty good summary of what Ian Foster has done to this team. He's taken what was a really, really good opportunity for any manager to be in charge of a progressive club with excellent recruitment and taken them very firmly backwards. And they weren't going backwards before. They had really good momentum going in the right direction. And that's not happened at all under Ian Foster. And you'll find you, you'll do very well to find anyone who can defend um, him and said that he deserves a bit longer because it's just not gone well at all. Um, well, they've given it to Neil Doosnip until the end of the season. He is the director of football, as I say. I'm not sure giving the job to the guy who appointed Ian Foster is the best move. Justin, what do you think? 
yeah, it's it's a bit um, it's a bit risky. Look, you know, I think Ian Foster's got very good coaching credentials, but I think bringing in someone who's inexperienced, who doesn't have you know a lot of club experience, that um, especially at championship level, I think is uh, I think it's you know you're stepping on a few problems there. Yeah, at the same time, though, what you know, what what market were Plymouth batting in? Can they afford to go for a, for a different type of manager, or do they need to, to go for someone like Ian Foster, who may have been a little bit more of a, a cheaper option? I don't know. So yeah, I, I, it is it is um, it is an interesting one that they they they've gone for the man who appointed um, uh, Ian Foster, but at the same time, we we've said it about uh, John Worthington at Huddersfield. Sometimes it just helps. It's cliched, but sometimes it just helps that they know the club, they know the players. So maybe on this occasion, it might work out for him. Well, Dusnit was in caretaker charge for four games after Stephen Schumacher left earlier in the season. He drew three and lost to Southampton. Um, so I don't know. It's, um, I mean, when I saw the sacking happen, I was certain they pressed the button, Justin. I don't even need to no. mention which button um, I'm referring to there. This does seem a bit risky. It's got to be said. Doosnip, he does have a lot of experience with managing the England youth teams. But this is a big job. This is the biggest job that he's going to have in probably his whole coaching career, getting Plymouth to the safety line with six games remaining. Because right now it's looking very much like it may very well be two of them Huddersfield and Sheffield Wednesday. We'll talk a bit more mm-hmm. about that later in the show, Justin. But yeah, this is a. Um, I'm not sure whether I, I would have thought this was the good idea. I think a, a firefighter, even though it is a club like Plymouth, who are, you know, so well run and such a progressive club, I, I think they may have to just take one on the chin here and just get a firefighter in. But, um, you know, we'll see how Doosnip does, shall we? They have got Rotherham away on Friday, which is, I mean, that is such a huge game, isn't it? They have got to get three points there, otherwise... Yeah, it won't be looking very good from a Plymouth Argyle perspective. Probably the most eye-catching result of Easter Monday, Sunderland won Blackburn 5. Um, it's Blackburn's first win under G- John Eustace, and what a way to get it, Justin. Yeah, it's, it's quite bonkers, really. The turning in away performance like that, I think, is is fantastic. And I think it probably makes the relegation picture look a little bit more clearer. But it's just a reminder of the attacking quality that they've got in the team. That if Eustace can get the right blend, it can, it can do some damage with this side. Because... I think Yondal Thomason was vastly underachieving with the results that they were getting. I know they had a fair few injuries, but the, the dynamic of this team changes when players come back. Sam Gallagher looked a bit nice, you know, a really good folly. Ryan Hedges looked sharp again. Sammy Schmodix is Sammy Schmodix. And again, it's a reminder of Tyrese Dolan's on form. He's, he's probably one of the most te- you know, gifted technicians in the division. You know, the way he's close control, his, his technique, his, his ability to... You know, get out of tight spaces, I think it's fantastic, but we don't see it often enough. It was a really good all-round attacking display, and it was devastating at the, <laughs> the very most. And to do it at the Stadium of Light as well, I just think it's, it's incredible. Well, we said after the Ipswich game on Good Friday that if Blackburn play like that for the rest of the season, they'll stay up. And, I mean, I don't think many expected them to play this much better just a few days later, but they were outstanding and fair play to them. You are right. Unsurprisingly, Sammy Schmodix was at the heart of it. Two goals and an assist. And I think Blackburn are increasingly aware that they'll do well to hold on to him this summer. But you're right to point out Ryan Hedges and Tyree Stolen. They both had excellent games. And they're quite an inconsistent pair. But when they're on it, they are two very good players. And I mean, you, you can't really fault any Blackburn player, to be honest. Everyone was just fantastic. Uh, because John Eustace had failed to win so many games as Blackburn manager, it's quite easy to forget just how bad they were towards the end of the Yondal Thomason era. They couldn't defend. The goals had dried up. They were essentially in free fall. So when it's as bad as it was, it's understandable that it, it, it took a bit of time for Eustace to... Mm turn it around but over time he's done that hasn't he yeah he has and that's the thing he's, he's, he's rectified the problems I think they've always had that attacking nous. it's just about choosing your moments and they had to do that because they, they tightened up they made themselves more difficult to beat and that's going to be at the sacrifice of, of some of their attacking play but they did that and now hopefully I don't think look, they're not going to win 5-1 every game but hopefully we see a little bit more a little bit more of that balance out of them because they've got a lot of really good players and I think if Eustace can find the right blend he can make this into a really good team because I think there was a there was a hope at one stage even from me that Thomason was turning them into a playoff chasing team maybe need a couple more additions in the summer but you know if, if Eustace can can finish the season right 
why why can't that be the aspiration next season? Yeah, well, they're not going to win every game 5-1. It is very much just a one-off. But what we can say for sure is that they're much harder to beat, aren't they? They've reduced the number of chances opposition teams are having greatly and are generally just playing a lot better. And these tend to be good ingredients for staying up. And while they have got a tough set of remaining games, they seem to be edging closer to staying up. And uh, that's a, John Eustace deserves quite a bit of credit for that. One team who'll be thankful that they're not a few points worse off is Sunderland because... Otherwise, they might be looking over their shoulder a bit, Justin, because they have been woeful recently, haven't they? They've now won just four points from an available 27. They did play well against Cardiff on Good Friday, to be fair. But, you know, it's quite incredible how shocking they've been since sacking Mick Beale. I'm not saying for a second that they were wrong to sack him, obviously. Um, but they've managed to reach a new level of shocking since then, haven't they? It's quite mad, really. Conceded 15 in eight games, scored just six in that time. I know Jack Clark's been a huge miss, but not not to this point. They can't defend. And it's bad. And, and again, though, I spoke about leadership within the squad. It just isn't there for me. So I'm not surprised that this has been such a significant drop-off when you go through three coaches in a, in a season when you don't have the required leadership in the dressing room. They're just the ingredients of a team, in, not in free fall, but they're going to drop off. I think off they are in free fall, Justin, aren't they? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's quite hard to actually make a, an argument against that. Again, you know, a little bit like Blackburn, you know there's a lot of quality in this team and you know they should be doing a lot a lot better. But I just think this, you know, this squad, it just lacks experience, it lacks leaders. And I think that's got, you know, you've got to point the finger up to, to the, the hierarchy. Unfortunately, I think they've got so many things wrong this season, starting from, starting from the transfer window last summer. Yeah, well, I mean, the second half of the season has been an unmitigated disaster for Sunderland, hasn't it? And it seems to be getting worse. When um, they appointed Jason Dodds as uh, the manager until the end of the Mike season, Dodds. Mike Dodds, sorry. Who's Jason Dodds? Jason Dodds is a Southampton fullback, an ex Southampton fullback from like the <laughs> early 2000s. Sorry, <laughs> dearie me. Uh, Mike Dodds. Um, yeah, uh, when they appointed Mike Dodds until the end of the season, I, I was still somewhat hopeful that they had an outside chance of getting the top six because he did a fairly decent job after um, after Tony Mowbray was sacked. But yeah, he, he, it's not gone very well at all. And I mean it with no disrespect to Blackburn, but losing five at home is bad. But when it's a team like Blackburn who have been struggling so much recently, it's, it's quite embarrassing and it pretty much sums up their season. The only positive to take from it is 16-year-old Chris Rigg getting on the score sheets because he, he looks a really really promising young lads but that's it that's the only positive you can take from this and I think most were expecting them to use last season as a building block for this season but that building block was apparently just made of sand because they've definitely gone backwards haven't they and Sunderland fans will be simply counting down the days until the season's over but even then where do they go next well they've reportedly got an idea of what to do because Paul Heckingbottom is said to be top of their wanted list to be their next manager. The club apparently see him as someone who ticks all the right boxes. What do you think, Justin? Eee, I like Heckingbottom. I think he deserves a chance, but I just don't think Sunderland's the right fit for, for him. And I don't think uh, he's the right fit for Sunderland. I mean, firstly, this really important point that I made uh, not too long ago. Paul Heckingbottom cannot work successfully outside of Yorkshire. <laughs> That's a really important point. It's a very good point. It, uh, they're always Hibs. He's been at Hibs. Um, where Barnsley. else has he been? Barn yeah, you know, Barnsley, Yorkshire. Uh, clubs outside of Yorkshire do not get on with Paul Heckingbottom. Sheffield United, um, obviously, as well. Yeah. I mean, he didn't do great at Leeds, though, did he? <laughs> yeah, but he also only got half a season. Um, so yeah. it's quite hard to judge him. But look, he's, he's, for me, it's just not quite the right fit. His Sheffield United tenure was, is, is a strange one because I think that squad, when they came down from the Premier League, were too good to... Uh, to not go back up at that point and then they slowly got older and older and that's why they're so bad in the Premier League this season Sunderland should should probably be looking elsewhere they should be looking for a young dynamic coach who isn't Mick Beale who has had experience of managing to to some varying degree of success because I do think it's a club with a lot of pull um, I just don't think Paul Heckenbottom is probably the right, the right choice here I don't know if I agree with you just now. I think you're being a bit harsh to 
Paul Heckingbottom. At the same time, I don't know if he is the right man to be Sunderland manager. Uh, he did a fantastic job in getting Sheffield United promoted last season. I think you are doing a bit, a bit of a disservice to him there because he didn't have a, gi a gigantic amount of backing and considering the other teams who were chasing promotion, I think he actually did really well to get them automatically promoted as comfortably in the end as they did. And look, it's not really his fault that they were getting battered each week in the Premier League because they were woefully unprepared for the task at hand. Well, he is the manager, but that squad, I, I don't think fucking Pep Guardiola could have kept Sheffield United from being bottom of the division. Um, I, I also feel like he perhaps doesn't get the recognition he deserves for the promotion because he's not a very fashionable manager because, you know, he's a 49-year-old bloke from Yorkshire who's not particularly charismatic and he has bottom in his surname. I, I think I think, I think think that does go against him. You laugh just him, but I do genuinely think that goes against him a bit. Um, so, you know, that shouldn't count against him, but it does in the eyes of many people. And having said all that, and perhaps I'm contradicting myself a bit here, I'm just not sure he is the answer for Sunderland. I, I, I don't, I can't really give a definitive reason why. I just think maybe I was hoping it's for his someone. Name. It's because his name. That's it's what it is. He's got bottom in his surname. No, I, th I think it, I think I was just hoping for someone, something a bit more ambitious, Justin. Yeah, I think that's it. A, a little bit more ambitious because Mick Beer wasn't ambitious, and Paul Hacking bottom isn't ambitious either. Um, if they're going for, let's say, a Will Still or you know, yeah, some. I, I some think the Will Still thing. The Will Still thing is really. You know, it's skewed everything. It, it? it has, and it? it's really yeah. skewed our expectations of who Sunderland should get in next. So, whoever they get in is going to be up against the fact that they're not Will Still. Yeah, no, you you are right. You are right. You are we are comparing far too often. But even even reading up on some of the managers they were linked with um, from Scandinavia, Kim Halberg, I think was was one, and his football philosophy seemed to marry up. I'm not going to go into detail on it now, but. Just reading about him, the coach's voice, and, uh, and Otto, I, you know, I really like the look of him. I don't really get that from Paul Hecking, but you know, I don't get that. Oh yeah, sort of thing. You know, you, that, you know, when you see what you want on a menu, you go, oh yeah, go on then. Mm. That's what that's what you want when you see a manager link with Paul Hecking. But um, I get a, uh, okay, all right, that's yeah. yeah, it's that sort of reaction. No, I think that's fair. I um, I mean, when they got rid of Tony Mowbray, I was pretty certain they would get a manager in from abroad and now it looks like they may be going down the path of Mick Beal and Paul Heckingbottom it just doesn't scream ambition does it and Paul and Mick Paul maybe Mick that is me being you know very talk sport about this whole thing and you know discrediting managers because they're not called Paul Heckingbottom Weola or whatever <laughs> um, but it just, pa Paolo Heckingbottom Paolo Heckingbottom yes <laughs> Um, I, I just don't know. Um, it'll be, it'll be. I, I'm incredibly interested to see who they do go for in the summer. Um, I, I, judging from the reaction from Sunderland fans, a lot of them don't seem very inspired by Paul Heckingbottom either. And let's go to Rotherham. They got their first win in 2024 and only their fourth victory of the season. It's after beating Millwall 2-1. It means Rotherham won't be breaking their own record for the fewest points won in a championship season of 23. They would have been officially relegated if they lost this game, actually, although that does seem to be delaying the inevitable, whatever the case. Why are you laughing, Justin? Because it's back on. They're coming out. They they they're coming. Okay. <laughs> offer them, offer them the survival, the survival trains are rolling. Down the great South escape. York. The it's greatest coming. escape is on. The, the greatest of escapes is coming. Yeah. Uh, well, it's an awful result for Millwall, isn't it? Let's be let's be serious with that. After a good start under Neil Harris, it is now just one win from five, four points above the relegation zone. What are you thinking with them, Justin? I, I'm not. I'm not too worried. They're, they're a difficult team to beat. They've had, yeah, had a rough run of games. Obviously, this Rotherham one's an ugly one. But if their team's going to play as similar to a Neil Harris team, it's going to be this Rotherham side. So therefore, it's probably not. It's probably the worst game they could have hoped for. To be honest with you, and again, just looking at the you know, recent results, they drew with West Brom, um, lost to lost to Leeds. It's not. It's not a bad run of games by any means. And I think out of those teams. In there, I would back you know Birmingham, Plymouth, Huddersfield, Sheffield Wednesday. I would back Millwall out of out of those teams because they just know how to defend, they know how to make things ugly, and and they'll do any they'll do whatever it takes to win. I don't think those teams have those types of minerals just yet. Um, 
because it's, it's Millwall and Neil Harris is just it, you know, he's putting in that Millwall attitude and I think it's a positive thing it's just it's just Rotherham isn't it you lose to Rotherham it's going to feel rough because at that point when you do lose to him they're the worst team ever to exist in the championship but unfortunately uh, it wasn't to be but as I say I think it's a style of play thing I think that's what that's what did them you know, if Rotherham played similar way to Millwall it's going to be difficult hmm. well I, I think my issue with Neil Harris is that he was a short term fix wasn't he he would be good for that you know new manager bounce and all that give the players a kick up the arse that kind of thing but I think that only gets you so far in terms of tactical awareness, he's definitely got to be one of the most limited managers in the league. And now it looks like we might be at a stage where Millwall need a bit more than a club legend telling them to do better. Because that's all I think Neil Harris particularly offers, really. I mean, they're still in a decent position and there are certainly clubs I'm more worried about going down but it is still a bit of a tenuous situation it has got to be said though considering if you compare their squad to the likes of Plymouth Huddersfield Sheffield Wednesday Millwall's squad is substantially better than those three that I've just mentioned there so if you're looking at pure quality of the squad they should stay up I'm just I just remain pretty unconvinced about Neil Harris being the medium to long-term answer short-term fine um but we are now getting to the stage where we're past short term and we're starting to see the uh, the shortfalls of bringing him in. Um, the only other thing I've got noted on this game, Justin, is when did Rotherham sign Charlie Wyke? He scored the winner here and it really caught me by surprise. That move completely passed me by. I'm pretty sure it's a deadline day signing, but he's obviously not done a lot since he went there. Um, yeah, it was a bit of a random one obviously... It's on the books that we're going to need one, but you know he's 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 and it, it, he's a Liam Richardson guy, isn't he? That's what it is. But he's it's a very <laughs> Liam Richardson guy. <laughs> Clearly not worked out. No, no. It just when I saw his name pop up on a soccer Saturday when I was watching all the games, I was like, oh, Charlie White. What? <laughs> really confused me. Uh, but there you go. Final game we'll talk about. Justin Stoke won. Huddersfield won a big game in the relegation battle, but these two couldn't be separated on Saturday. Uh, Saturday, Monday afternoon. A better showing from Huddersfield. We were saying in Saturday's show how it was a a bit of a worry how poorly they were playing. This was an improvement. A well taken goal by Bojan Radulovic. This was his first goal since signing in January. They could really do with him doing that a lot more often because they have been a, a bit toothless going forwards it's got to be said um, just a, let's look at the relegation battle I'm not ruling anyone else out here but would you say it's looking increasingly likely that it's going to be two of Huddersfield Plymouth and Sheffield Wednesday joining Rotherham in League One next season joining Rotherham yeah oh, so a day, don't a day. don't start giving me that bollocks about the Gunter game. <laughs> Can we be serious here for a sec? I'm, I'm just going to point out, Plymouth, Huddersfield, Sheffield Wednesday cannot buy wins at the moment. And if Rotherham do the He is joking, ladies and gentlemen. And wins six games in a row. Justin Peach has a habit of saying these things and sounding deadly serious, but he is joking. Justin, two of Huddersfield, Plymouth and Sheffield Wednesday, what are you saying? Okay, providing that we're counting Rotherham out, I think it's foolish, but providing we are... Um, <laughs> I, I it's uh, I think it's, I, I'm going to go with Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, I mean, Danny Raw was seething after the game. Um, I think it's uh, I, I think don't, that sort of attitude coming out of just the game. I'm not necessarily looking for who you think is going down. I'm just saying, do you think it will be two of Huddersfield, Plymouth, and Sheffield Wednesday? No, and I'm, and I'm saying Sheffield Wednesday were one of the two. It's very, it's very hard to see them coming out of it. But with Huddersfield and Plymouth, I think it's so hard to call between those because it's literally going to be a case of you know, can Neil Duship uh, Duship come out of this. Uh, and generate a run of form. Is he is he going to do that? Is he going to is he going to pick up um, from the, the rubble that Ian Foster's left behind? Can can Andre Brighton right to actually get his Huddersfield team clicking? Because obviously the goal that Bojan Radulovic scored was fantastic, but they didn't see the game out, and that's been a case quite often this season where they can't not see games out. Cost Darren Moore his job. You know that's a that's a thing with Huddersfield this season. It's not just a, a new manager thing or an old manager thing. It's clearly a, it's clearly just a thing for him this season. They cannot manage the games very well. I, I I think it's so hard to call. If I was to make if I was to make a split judgment as to who's more likely, I would argue Huddersfield over Plymouth. But at the same time, Plymouth can't score goals. And that's a bad thing in football. I think it's so hard to call. So you're saying two of those three? Yeah, it's it's whoever's going to be bluntest. Who's got the bluntest instrument here? Is it Huddersfield? Is it Plymouth? And Sheffield Wednesday. 
Yeah. Well, we're getting to that stage where a five point gap for someone like Stoke, for example, is actually quite big with six yeah. games remaining, particularly when the three teams who we were talking about here are just so out of form. I mean, Birmingham are well amongst it points wise, but they got a great win against Preston, which could be the start of them climbing away. Millwall's form has dipped recently, which is a concern, but, you know, Huddersfield and Plymouth are so appallingly out of form. Well, Sheffield Wednesday have been down there for so long and also struggling for form now that you would say these three are the main contenders at this stage with, you know, Millwall, Birmingham, possibly a couple of others as kind of edging contenders for the lack of a better term. But, you know, quite a bit can change in six games, but that's certainly how it's looking right now. I mean, it would have been absolutely hilarious if Plymouth got Neil Warnock in and he relegated Huddersfield. I've got to say that for sure, but that doesn't look like it's going to happen now. But yeah, it's a, it's going to be a tight one, this relegation battle. I think it's going to go right down to the wire. But now we are getting to the period where the six games remaining, we are starting, I think, to see teams being kind of eliminated from the equation. And while there are you know, plenty of teams who still haven't been completely ruled out um, we are getting to that period where uh, you know it is starting to thin out this relegation battle and it it will take Huddersfield and Plymouth having quite a big pickup by their current standards to uh, actually make things more interesting than uh, it looks like it may be getting to. Uh, but there we go ladies and gentlemen that's been the second tier podcast talking about the Easter Monday games in the championship. And we'll next be back for the preview show on Friday, where we'll be looking ahead to all the games coming up this coming weekend. And I tell you what, it is getting mouth-watering, isn't it, here in the Championship? Of course, we'll talk about the East Anglian Derby next Friday, and we bloody look forward to seeing you then for it. But hey, have a great few days until then. And this has been the Second Tier Podcast. I have been Ryan Dilks. I have been... Just in peace. <laughs> <laughs> he got so emotional ending the episode there, ladies and gentlemen. And a big thank you for listening.